as we sort of move along through the various themes, one of the things that we, we learned last night, and one of the things that's as fairly broadly known is that human beings are becoming an urban species. And as a part of that challenge, how do we integrate uh, the natural world within that growing urbanism? How do we think about the, the process of making a habitat for people as a part of what we do? So within that context, we've got a pair now. They're going to talk about uh, the, the role of, of forestry and the sort of integration of trees and that environment within the context of the city. So we have two speakers, Philip Potyandi. Uh, he told me a Hungarian pronunciation last night at dinner, but I can't remember what that is. And Eric Becker is with Field Operations, and he's going to talk about the Nicolette Mall. So this will give us some sense of how we can begin to think about the human habitat as something that happens inside the cities. All right, how about that? Thank you, professionals. I love having people to help. Uh, this is so. This is such a great experience for me. Uh, I encourage you. To, uh, th so usually I'm at, I'm an urban forester. So usually I'm at arboriculture conferences, urban forestry conferences, and this is so great to be with landscape architects, designers, ecologists, uh, and people managing these huge projects. You guys blew my mind. Like the scale you're working at, adding sediment, like. When I hear people back home talking about like stream bank restoration, it's all about we want nothing in the water. Get get the sediment out of there and get, control the edge for this. It's a whole different ecology. It's so so intriguing, and I and I learned a lot last night from Nina Marie. So I'm really thank you for for having me here. I'm really excited. So as I said, I'm an urban forester, and in urban forestry, I think about it as a multi generational opportunity. An obligation and this is one in which each generation has the uh, obligation to improve on the state of the urban forest uh, based on the current science so take what we've look in the literature learn from what we've done in the past and it's usually a handed down generational thing I feel so fortunate to have had previous urban forest managers in Minneapolis that have done a really great work, and people across the country and world, frankly, to, to have learned from to inform the decisions we're making today in our, our urban realm. And so today, we're focusing on projects, really specific, except for me. I get to talk about urban forestry generally. Um, uh, but, and then I'll hand it off to, to Eric to talk specifically about Nicollet Mall, and then we'll have a bit of a dialogue together uh, with, with the two of us and also with you after we each present uh, our, our part of this. But thinking about projects, you know, as, as an urban forester, we're the, we're the long-term caregivers of a lot of things, like, uh, a lot of projects that get designed into our urban settings. So, uh, so we're, we're the caregivers of those projects, which have a scale, uh, but then we also care for all the public trees across the municipality. So all the street trees, all the parkland trees, and all the woodland trees, in addition to high quality, uh, very focused projects in highly developed areas. So there's a bit of a mix there. And something Nina Marie talked about yesterday was, was thinking about all the benefits that trees provide. There's a host of benefits that trees provide and we can think about those benefits in terms of ecosystem services and, and or, or rather ecosystem solutions. That was, that was nice, I, I appreciated that yesterday. Um, and we can quantify some of these and, and put dollar values on them. Uh, and we can also, and, and so there's really great tools out there for doing this. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of, who, who's heard of the Urban Forest, or what's it called? The National Benefits tr Tree Calculator. So you, we can, you can plug a tree into this thing, and it's peer-reviewed literature, uh, you know, science that's, that backs this up. Okay, you've got a 20-inch uh, catalpa, 20-inch, four and a half feet off the ground. Um, it, it provides 281 quantifiable benefits every year. And, and as it grows, it'll keep, it'll keep increasing the amount of benefits and, and be up to 330 uh, within a few years. But that's a per tree thing. We can also look at this and look at, it, at the whole urban forest scale. And so in Minneapolis, I can, I can, because we've done these analyses, I can say, hey, every, the average, and just looking at our Parkland public trees and our street public trees, combining those, 
uh, we know that every tree in that population provides about $100 worth of benefits per year, which is pretty cool. And you can add those up, and that's $19.5 million of benefits, uh, of quantifiable benefits, uh, to, the, to the people who enjoy Minneapolis, whether you're coming to visit or, or, or you live there, you get those benefits. And what's kind of cool is you can do, a, a, you know, cost benefit, or like how we also manage it. And we pay a lot of money to manage trees in Minneapolis and cities all over the, all over the place. For every $1 we spend on urban forest maintenance and, and management, planting, removal, um, um, pruning, we get $1.80 in benefits back from those trees. So that's really awesome. Um, and those benefits, those quantifiable ones that I'm talking about are stormwater benefits. So looking at uh, slowing down water as, it, as it's getting to our waterways um, or, or keeping it out of uh, our stormwater system. Uh, property values, increasing property values, the more trees we have in an area. Uh, carbon avoiding the use of uh, carbon or, or fuels that create carbon in their emissions, but also sequestering carbon into the, the biomass of trees. And reducing energy, both in the summer um, from cooling, which is like you think about that with shading, but also in the winter uh, by reducing winds, um, by slowing winds down, we're saving on heating energy in, in the urban forest. That, that was actually some of my master's work was looking at that, that relationship. And then uh, uh, improving air quality. So taking uh, particulate matter and, and all sorts of nasty stuff out of the air, trees, trees serve that function for us. But there's a lot of other benefits out there too. Uh, which is really, and so, some are quantifiable uh, in addition to the ones I, I outlined, but then, but some are, some are a little less quantifiable. You know, what's the, how, can you put a dollar value on uh, ch children being able to focus more in school by being surrounded by green space? Like every now and then, just like look out the window and you can see trees. Um, that, 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 sh that should be helping. It helps me. Uh, and so you can think about the return on investment. Um, uh, as well, thinking of this, this financial thing. And, and so t this, there's literature that can back up. Well, it takes, it takes about, you think about the cost to plant a tree. You, got, you have to prepare the site, you have to buy the tree, you have to grow that tree in a nursery before you even put it in the ground, and then you have to get it to, to become established and then get it growing, and then at some point it starts giving you that, you know, when it's 28 inches and it's catalpa, it gives you that 200 some 80 uh, benefits a year. Well, it's got to get to a certain size before it starts kicking back those benefits. And so, you know, it might be, 15 to 20 years before you start getting benefits. But if we really, like, when's a tree really mature though? Um, you know, we're looking at like 80 years down the line. So we're, we're thinking about a time frame uh, that I think is I interesting in this dialogue too, to be thinking long term. But, you know, what, how long can a tree serve us? And when's, when's a tree really succeeding? I mean, we've got 150, 300 years um, of having trees on the landscape. And then, you know, I got to visit this tree yesterday. Who knows who's visited this tree? Do you know? It's here on campus, it's just beautiful. And who is this? <laughs> he was just there. I was just walking around, I saw a cool tree, and, and Dr. Eric North was just there hanging out, and I was like, oh, uh, tell me about this tree. And Man, we, we don't get bald cypress this size back home, but how long is that uh, needed to be fostered to become this mature of a tree? So it's providing some of these ecosystem services uh, or solutions um, and some of these quantifiable ones, but also, man, I get a feeling when I see trees like that. And that, 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 that's an encouragement that uh, I'm not sure I can put a dollar value on. So we're, we're at Nexus. Um, so th this next section, I've got these little kind of five vignettes of my thoughts on urban forestry or my encouragement. I'm gonna give a, a design encouragement uh, related to urban trees. Uh, back that up with, with e ecologically why I want to encourage that design practice and then thinking about our management or our, our horticulture, um, the sort of, so that I guess that would be the, um, um, my plea, Pl please do this, uh, this is why and this is how we're managing that in Minneapolis, thinking about the horticulture. And so, number one, I'd like to encourage uh, you to maximize canopy in designs where you're working with, with trees in, in our urban landscape. And the reason for that is about these benefits. Um, and, and you get, benefits are directly connected to the amount of leaf area. So the more leaves on a tree and the more leaf area on a tree, the more benefits we're getting or, or ecosystem uh, services. And so how are we trying to achieve that, at least in, in the, the Minneapolis model? 
uh, we have tree planting guidelines that's that, that outline how to act in the, or how we uh, uh, plant trees and, and what rules we use when we're planting trees. Those are in our city standard specifications and they're also uh, in reference tools that our internal staff use. So whether you're, you're coming in to design uh, uh, something in Minneapolis or you're, you're directly on the team uh, working in the public realm, um, we're using the same guidelines. So we're thinking about the growing space and we want to uh, use the maximum amount of growing space both below ground, above ground, uh, below ground and above ground. So if you have a, a huge a tree lawn or, or, or a lot of rooting space available and also a lot of space above the tree, uh, we want to see the largest growing tree possible for that space at maturity. Uh, and, uh, and the inverse would be, say you have power lines. Well, uh, we, do, we don't want to see a large tree there. We want to see an appropriate sized tree that, that won't conflict with that, that other infrastructure. Or maybe it's up against a building and it needs to be a smaller tree. Or maybe we just have low soil volume or a narrow strip of property where we would have uh, conflicts with the roots. So we would need a, a smaller growing tree in that space. We also use these guidelines to uh, uh, guide spacing. And so we, we have the model of, you know, we don't have just like every tree needs to be 40 feet apart, um, no matter what the size. No, it's, it's we, we hone it to be 75% of the trees, uh, of the tree's size at maturity, the width of the tree. So if you look at like a, a nursery catalog, it'll say like that, this tree grows to 40 feet. Okay, so we're gonna go 75% of that, 35 feet is how close we, we might think about spacing it. And the goal there is to achieve um, a canopy that, it, that becomes connected over time and that so that we can maximize that leaf area in our urban, urban spaces from, uh, and get, uh, f for the sake of tree benefits. My next design encouragement is to increase diversity. And this is specifically uh, an encouragement at the generous scale. And so the reason for that is, is to try to achieve a, a resiliency in, in our urban forest, a, an urban forest that can take um, uh, future forest pests, or future and also current ones, uh, and, and be resilient against those, those pests. And the reason uh, I'm speaking at the genus level is because there's a lot of acronyms out there. Um, Dutch elm disease it impacts elm trees. That's one genera, that's one genus of, of tree. Uh, oak wilt impacts oaks. Uh, emerald ash borer impacts ash trees. And it doesn't cross from, from genera in, in these examples. There are uh, urban forest pests that do cross multiple genera, and, and that's something we also need to be, th be thinking about. But, but increasing diversity at the, at the genus level is really helpful um, to make sure that we're, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, if you will. But it also is, it helps uh, mitigate future, uh, besides future pests that might come, future climatic differences that might uh, um, be coming or just, or different impacts to the forest that might be focused more on one type of tree than another. Uh, if we have diversity uh, in, the, in the mix, that, that, that will help us mitigate and have a more resilient system. And so what are we doing to manage uh, having resiliency and, and increased diversity in the urban forest? Same, same thing, we've got the tree planting guidelines. They, they talk about canopy, but they also talk about diversity. And it's, a, it's at multiple scales. Another thing that, that our keynote talked about last night, um, thinking about it, we think about diversity at the city scale, we manage it at the neighborhood scale and also at the streetscape or block scale. And so some examples of those guidelines when we're looking at the neighborhood scale, we have a rule that limits the number of, if something, if a tree in our street tree population is already represented higher than 10%, it's no longer on the list to choose in that neighborhood. Even if you're on a street that doesn't have, say, uh, maples on that street, um, if, it's, if it's over in the neighborhood, it's off the list for a tree to choose for an available planting space. And so we, we can look at, so here's an example. Uh, in this neighborhood, you can see we've got um, elm, Linden, honey locust, and maple are over 10%. It's 12, 14, and 26. And so those are off the list uh, for selecting a, if there's an available planting space in this neighborhood. And we're getting kind of close on elms, so let's watch out um, and, and look at the other parts of our um, tree list to think about what to plant in our available planting spaces. We're also ensuring we have diversity and resiliency at the streetscape level. And so we're looking at, uh, we, we, if, if we, we limit the number of trees um, per genus to five. 
So if there's already three pin oaks on a block and two bur oaks on a block, there's no, there's no room for bicolor oaks on this block. There's no room for any oaks on this block. This block's filled as, in terms of oak. Let's find another genus uh, to, to, to plant into this location. And the reason for this, the, if we, if we kind of go in time, uh, the urban forest has been handed down. We, it, it used to just be all elm tree, American elms in, in a lot of cities, especially in Minneapolis was one of those. It's common for people to say, oh, they, those managers didn't learn anything. And after Dutch elm disease, we, we still have elms, but, but we lost a lot. After Dutch elm disease came through, all they did was plant ash trees. Well, no, they planted a diverse mix. Um, it was, but they put, they put the maples here, they put the lindens here, they put the, um, the you know, hackberries here, and they put the ash over here. If you live on that ash block, it doesn't feel like diversity. Even though if you, if you do an analysis, you've got really good diversity. We increased diversity a ton. It went from like 90% one thing to you know, no more than 20, uh, maybe 30% one thing. But if you're on the ash block, it doesn't feel like it. So, so our guidelines, you know, continuing to move the bar forward. I guess I was going this way for moving the bar forward. Uh, we want to ensure that, that we have a diverse streetscape. So when someone walks out the front door of their home or business uh, and some, few, some pest comes through and, and takes away a bunch of trees, they don't lose everything. But we have resiliency there by having multiple species, genus rather. We're also limiting, this is a challenge, uh, ALB is Asian longhorn beetle. And Asian longhorn beetle impacts a lot of different genus, genera. And, and so we limit it to five trees that are the preferred host of Asian longhorn beetle on a block so that if an eradication effort happens, unlike some of those other forest pests that I talked about, um, that once they come, they're sort of there to stay and you just kind of have to manage dealing with them. When Asian longhorn beetle shows up in someone's city, it, 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 it is one that the goal is to eradicate it. And to eradicate it, uh, uh, APHIS comes in, uh, the, the, the US, uh, you know, the, the federal, from the federal government, and comes in and, and the, the, the managers figure out where the infestation is, they draw a quarter mile buffer around it, and then they remove everything, public or private, all trees that are on the preferred host list, gone, um, whether it has it or doesn't, so that we try to eradicate that pest and pesticides uh, can be part of it too, besides tree removal, in addition to tree removal. And so, th so the preferred hosts that, that uh, we would be planting in the street tree plant uh, scape in Minneapolis include birch, buckeye, maple, elm, and plane tree. That's a super diverse block. You know, if you, if you take those five genus and plant them across a street scape, you've got a lot of diversity, but one pest can wipe them out. So we want to ensure the, uh, resiliency against that pest too, because it's a known pest that, that could show up any day. Well, we've been criticized for this. You know, we're, we're really restricting the, the, the design. Like, wait, wait, no, it's gonna be, it's gonna be more, I, I want the consistency of having this one type going down this block. Um, and so it, it's been kind of fun that this is, we uh, was having a discussion with a, with a landscape architect about uh, uh, increasing the, the diversity in a, in a plan and giving, giving our feedback about, we, we wanna see more diversity for the sake of resilience of, for you know, forest pests that might be coming. You, know, you don't understand, this is design. You, this is, you know, this, you forestry people, this, this isn't hot dish forestry, this is design. You're never gonna, I, I, was, I was very dismissed about, about what we were, were trying to go for. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing dialogue to try to figure this out. I think this is a good discussion point to be thinking about. How do you, uh, you know, ensure resilience in, in an uh, urban area and, and have beautiful design? Like, there's, what a great challenge. Okay, three more encouragements. An encouragement to succeed uh, at, at establishing trees and also having long-term um, success in trees by managing uh, the soil and, 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 and having appropriate soil uh, for, for a growing space. And, and appropriate as in the right type of soil, but also the type, um, but also the right amount of soil so that we can grow trees uh, to get them to benefit providing size. And, and so we have a multiple tree, plant, uh, tree planting typologies, um, I stop being different than the guidelines, uh, that sort of help us guide uh, designs in the public realm. The, the first priority that we have is to have a continuous open boulevard. So this is kind of the traditional uh, streetscape where you have the, the road, the tree lawn or boulevard, and then the sidewalk. And um, so this is, this is the, this is the 
the creme de la creme. It's actually the most affordable to put in if you have the space for it. Um, and so our goal is, is we, we, we just want this to be eight feet wide. And so then we don't have conflicts with the tree roots and, and the sidewalk or, or other infrastructure. And we want to make sure we have 24 inches of viable soil uh, for, for the trees to be growing in. As we get to, into higher, more developed areas, we have a different typology that might need to work. And it's, it's very similar. This one's open planting space. And it would be in a more developed area. It's, it just does, it's similar to open, grow, open uh, continuous open boulevard, but it doesn't go the whole block. So it, it can be you know, one section per tree or for multiple trees to have a, root, a soil volume. And we have a minimum standard that requires in our, in our, our standard specifications, 125 square feet of surf, surface area for, the, for uh, the, the trees to be growing in, minimum of five feet wide to, to avoid conflicts with uh, adjacent infrastructure, and also that 24 inches of viable soil. And in our most highly developed areas, we, we have a, a typology for engineered root space. So this is getting into uh, your, your, your uh, more developed downtown areas. But however, we have, we have uh, continuous open grown boulevards in uh, our downtown areas as well. But where we need to, we can, we can have engineered root space. This is the most costly, uh, this is kind of on a spectrum here. And so we require a volume of 500 uh, cubic feet of, of soil, viable soil for the trees to be growing in, and, and, a, and a minimum of five feet wide for that soil volume to be, and it has to be between three and four foot uh, uh, deep for the, for the trees to be uh, putting their roots into, and a minimal sur minimum surface serviceable opening of five by five. And, and we discourage the use of a grate in that. We, we, the grate, uh, a tree grate doesn't benefit walking in terms of our ADA compliance, um, but, but uh, so we, we, if, if we can't use it to, as a walking surface, then we, we don't really want it there to be um, uh, just a management challenge. Uh, so, but they can, grates can be put in these as well, but we need to make sure we have five by five to actually get in and remove a tree and replace it when that comes in the, in the life cycle of a tree at some point. And so this engineered root space uh, is examples of it would include structural soil, whether that's a rock-based structural soil or a sand-based structural soil. It could also be a suspended pavement system. Um, so an example, uh, one of the proprietary ones is like, I think, sil silva cells, um, and there, there are others, uh, examples of that. You could just design it with like, you know, uh, something on, on piers um, um, as well, but, but suspending the pavement above, above a system is, is another example. One of, the, one of our other thinking about, uh, about soil, and, and about establishment is that uh, thinking about, you know, a plan gets designed, it gets installed, and then it gets turned over. Um, typically, there's like a warranty somewhere in there, and, and maybe it's, I think those are typically maybe a year. Um, but one of the things that we're, we're working on is thinking about if, if, if really large trees are being planted on a project, um, to have an instant, you know, instant bang from, from getting a, a large tree in the landscape, uh, it takes a long time for those trees to get over that transplant shock. And, and so one of the things we want, but we're, but we're taking responsibility before the tree might get over that transplant shock. And so um, one of the things we're requiring in our standards is an irrevocable letter of credit or for, for the project to post a refundable de deposit to the tune of $600 per tree so that we can replace a tree if needed. And that needs to be on the books for one year per inch of caliper, if it's over three. If it's a three inch tree or smaller, uh, this doesn't need to happen. But if it's, say it's a five inch tree, we need five years of um, of, of having this money available. And if, if all the trees survive, no big deal. If some, if some of them don't, um, then we would be using these funds to, to do, deal with the tree replacement. I think I'm down to two more. Yeah. I want to encourage uh, that you design for project succession. So thinking of you know, uh, you'll, design, you'll design it, it'll get installed, and then somebody and, and some place gets to benefit from that project for a long time and gets to maintain it for a long time into the future. And so thinking about that in the design process is, is an important part of, part of a design. And the, that's both, to, both in thinking about the permanent caregivers that will be taking it on, but also the local conditions. 
you know, what, what weather will be coming through? Um, what, what are the restrictions just within the local government for managing those trees? And, and if, if someone's managing the trees, who's managing the, the surfaces around it? And who's managing the, the irrigation? And, and what about the, the snow management? And all these different parts. Knowing that is pretty important for making sure that there's long-term success in a project. So it isn't just a, a short little blip in the, in the pan in terms of long-term so that you have a perpetuation. And some of the ways we're working on that uh, is we're trying to get uh, compliance with the specifications, with our standard specifications, with those tree planting guidelines, with the different typologies. Um, and, and the process we have for that is the plan review process. So we, um, the people from, the, our tree preservation coordinator sits on, on plan review to, so when plans get submitted at various parts in, in the plan cycle at certain percentages, uh, there can be a dialogue to say, oh, hey, I know th th there's, um, I, you, need, you need this list of uh, the neighborhood diversity, which, which will show you that uh, there's too many of this tree in this part of town already, so can you try to find a different genus uh, on your plan? Or, or let's think about the spacing um, so we maximize these tree benefits, but that we can have that dialogue. Oh, I guess that was it for yeah, plan review. Okay. Aren't trees nice? <laughs> the last one I have is a challenge. And I, and I want to challenge you, and this is, this is one we can talk a little bit more, I think, during the discussion if it, if it goes in that direction. Um, but the, I have a challenge to design to preserve existing trees, existing successes, let's say, in, 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 our urban, in the urban realm. And, and the reason is, you know, a, a damaged tree or actually a completely removed tree uh, doesn't provide ecosystem services, um, or as, at least not as many if it's damaged. If it's gone, you're not getting those services. And you're essentially starting over when you replant after that. And, and so, because it takes a while to get those, 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 uh, those solutions. And so horticulturally, one of the ways we're working that is also through that oversight. The, the plan review is a part of it. Um, and, but, but we're thinking we have in our standard specifications tree protection zones. And so during the construction process, if a tree has been identified that needs to be preserved, um, there's ways to do it. And, and we, we have a, in the specification says, okay, four and a half feet off the ground, the tree is this big. Um, so that's like 20 inches. And so for every inch of diameter, we require the root space of that tree to be protected with a, with a fence out to 20 feet. So it's one, it's one, for every one inch of diameter, a foot of protection space around that tree. Now that doesn't need to be applied out to the middle of the street because the roots aren't going out under the street, but where the roots are growing in, say it's a boulevard strip, um, we, we need to have the tree protection uh, fencing up to keep equipment out, to keep the soil from getting compacted, to keep equipment from washing out and putting uh, concrete into that space. And that's all outlined, uh, you know, one, one could just take this and put it right into the construction drawings. Um, this is all available in our city standard specifications as something that uh, folks can just plug and play with. Uh, and and if, if a tree is d d decided, oh, the, the, the plan is such that um, these trees are going to be removed uh, for this reason, and this is, this is the, new, the new, new design that's going to come in, um, as we're thinking about a tree removal permit, which is a required part of the process, we're looking at, okay, uh, when, for the trees that are removed, what are we getting in return? What's, what's, what's the, what's the long-term happening in the urban forest to, to sort of <coughs> mitigate that loss? So what are we doing for tree planting? Um, in response to, to the trees getting removed and looking at the, the weight of, of those two things. And when they're, if, if we're, we're not, if it's out of alignment, um, then there's fees associated so that we can, if it's not gonna happen on this project, then it needs to happen somewhere else in the urban forest for us to continue to perpetuate uh, the responsibility of tending the urban forest for the, for the people we serve. Um, but, and we also have field, field collaboration. We have, uh, the, I mentioned tree preservation coordinator that, that is, is out on job sites working with the install crews to try to figure stuff out. Like, hey, this tree was slated for removal, but hold on. Um, I think if, if instead of running this gigantic piece of equipment that would lop off half the roots on the tree as it goes by to put in the curb, 
just stop 20 feet before that tree and start, the, start it again 20 feet after and gap and ham form around that tree. It, it's, a, it's a little bit more work, but we save this tree and it's worth it in the, in the, the, the short term of, of you having that little bit of a challenge right there is, 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 is good for the long term. Uh, other solutions we can have is to raise grades. So if it's a sidewalk reconstruction uh, and, and the roots have been heaving up the, the sidewalk, well, maybe we can raise grades so instead of cutting those roots off to get the sidewalk down where it needs to be. Um, if we go back far enough, we can still have ADA compliance and have that sidewalk go up and then gradually go back down and, and get the job done and we've saved a, a really important infrastructure in the in the city that, that being that tree or, or tweak the alignment if, if, if there's the, say that same scenario of a sidewalk well maybe we can just there's if there's enough room in the right-of-way maybe in on the you know the, the yard side opposite the street maybe we can just move that sidewalk in just a little bit to give a little bit more room for those roots to get down into the taper where they're actually getting low enough where they're not having the infrastructure challenge. And so uh, we, I've, my, my design pleas ha, ha, have been to increase tree canopy or maximize tree canopy with the designs you, you put forth. Um, increase genetic diversity, spe specifically genus diversity as, as you're uh, thinking of the planting palettes you're, you're using. So that we have successes that 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 are installed uh, both in for establishment and also long term into our into our urban spaces, and and also thinking about the the, the succession of a plan as it gets it's getting handed off to the people that benefit from it for a really long time, um, and and the, those who care for the forest for those people, and also uh, the, the the challenge to to preserve trees. In, in, in planting plans, and, and that's a that, I think that's a, that is a, ch a challenge to, to not start with a clean slate, but rather preserve what is around so that we have um, resiliency for a long time in our, in our urban forest and urban spaces. Um, and uh, because long-term beautiful urban forests are, are, are really nice. And, and they, they do provide a lot, a lot for us. So, so with that, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Eric to, t to talk about a really specific, really awesome, cool project on Minnesota's Main Street. I think that's one of the quotes, the, the, the names for it. But it'll take us a minute to just change over. But, and, and, then, and then we're going to, uh, after he talks about that, we, we'll have a dialogue together and, and with, with, with you and with each other to, to think more. foresters and landscape architects have some differing opinions, but we also have a lot of um, uh, the same opinions as well. So um, one of those being, we we're on the walk over here this morning and, and Philip mentioned, at least we know how to wear, the, we, we knew to wear the same color, you know, so <laughs> we got something right today. Um, but here, hang on one second. Oh, awesome. All right, perfect. All set, there we go, thank you. Uh, the other thing that we have differences in, I don't have this fl uh, fancy flash PowerPoint, but we do, <laughs> as landscape architects, have some nice renderings and, and things like that. So um, I'm excited to be here today. I, uh, my name's Eric Becker, I'm a landscape architect with James Corner Field Operations based in New York City, but I um, actually have some local roots. I'm originally from Iowa, went to Iowa State University. So close that my parents were able to make it over here today. So they made the, the journey over. Uh, so it's good to have them here as well. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about, um, again, is, is urban forestry and how uh, that relates to a project in the urban environment, um, like Nicolette Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Um, so with this project, we actually had a really great uh, collaboration, a team, um, starting with our team, field operations based out of New York City, uh, and then we had a lot of local expertise on the project, uh, civil engineers, um, architects, lands other in landscape architects, um, and then some local urban forestry uh, involvement and local nurseries were involved with the process as well. So. 
a lot of great input. Um, along with that, through design, we'd like to always involve the, uh, those that will be using the space, the, the stakeholders of the, the properties and, and everything. Um, so we went through pretty extensive um, research and interactive public meetings, um, getting input on what people wanted to see on, on the mall. Um, so we actually had this board up that had all these different um, streetscapes um, and, and people got to vote on what they thought was the best, what they thought they would want to see Nicolette Mall become. Um, and so throughout that whole process, we were able to gather a lot of data on, on that and find out that people really wanted to see a walkable, uh, wide sidewalks, no, they wanted no car traffic, um, things like that, farmers markets, uh, greenery, planting, public seating, um, retail, dining, entertainment. So we got, got a good feel for what the, the public really wanted uh, on Nicolette. Uh, again, just a ton and ton of meetings with the stakeholders, uh, the, business, uh, the businesses along the mall, um, and then all the other uh, government city agencies and things like that. Uh, so to give you a little context on Nicolette Mall, um, the red line there is, is Nicolette with the, amongst this very grid-like structure of the city. Um, it's a 12-block uh, renovation, about a mile long, that really connected the Mississippi River waterfront to the Loring Woods, and I'll show that here, along with um, the Channel Lakes and how that all incorporated into the overall context of this project. Uh, so here in the, in the blow up, um, looking at the Loring Woods Park and Loring, uh, Loring Greenway on the lower su southern end of the site and on the northern side up towards the uh, Mississippi River. And how can we tie in these two completely, not completely isolated, but semi-isolated um, landscapes and, and, and spaces where urban forestry was a, a prominent uh, portion of those, pro of those areas. Uh, here we go. And, and then some of the Nicolette history. Um, so uh, trying to figure out how we could tie in the new design with the Lawrence Halpern design of the mid 60s. Um, the curvature uh, of the roadway uh, where he took the, the road from a four lane road down to a two lane road um, and developed these curv curvature of the road which allowed more public space, open space on different elements and areas along the mall. Um, so, and also looking at that, looking at a smaller scale on the site, um, how that would really break down from the building facade to the curve of the road, uh, the curb of the road, um, needing to have a, a clear walk zone so people had a clear path of travel along the entire stretch of the mall, and then uh, developing these uh, planning, seating, gathering space areas. Uh, there's a number of the blocks where we have uh, outdoor cafes um, where people are seating and eating along the mall. So, uh, and then you have your curb zone, your loading zone for buses, uh, things like that. So uh, Nicolette only has bus, bus traffic. Uh, no uh, other cars are allowed on Nicolette. Um, so it's only um, public transportation. And then looking at uh, Nicolette and where it really falls in line with other, um, you know, streetscapes along uh, around the city, around the U.S. Um, your typical streetscape of Michigan Avenue, where it's all heavy traffic, to Pearl Street and Boulder, uh, 16th Street, and um, you know, downtown Denver, where there are pedestrian malls only. Uh, we fall more or so on the pedestrian only side, trying to look at uh, different tabled intersections to allow uh, pedestrian movement to be a very um, mainstream route down the mall. Um, and then just looking at different uh, moments um, with the paving, simple durable pavement that lasts in, in the harsh environments of Minneapolis, uh, signage and wayfinding and how people navigate their way down, down the streetscape. Um, and then again, these through walk zones along your, uh, your cafes, outdoor cafes, how these people interact uh, as you're moving down the mall. 
and then again, as I mentioned, the tabled intersections. Uh, and greening of the mall was a, a huge design component of this entire project. Um, you know, we have right around 240 trees on the mall. Um, when we, we came on board and started looking at this, there was about 130 um, trees that were cur uh, previously there. Um, we looked at um, how, how that all worked within our entire design. And um, this is where we have some, probably some conflicting things between the urban forester and, and, and our design field. And how we could work through that um, was, was some challenges for sure. Um, you know, there was, and our look at it, there was a lot of trees that were in decline. Um, they had reached their, their maximum soil capacity uh, and, and growth because of the soil capacity that was provided to those, to those uh, trees. So um, I'll get into, into that a little bit more as I go through this. Uh, but looking at uh, program space, so there's a, a series of spots along the mall where uh, we have the reading room and we have the theater in the round down on um, block 11 is what, the, what I refer to it as, um, down in front of the library, um, which are spaces where, uh, you know, people can program, uh, the library can have programming for that space, etc. So this is a quick look at just a couple of the blocks and some of the um, crazy utilities that uh, we dealt with in an urban environment. Um, it is, becomes a major challenge, um, especially when you're talking about trying to preserve trees and uh, bringing in new trees on, on site. Um, as you can see, the chaotic amount of water lines, sanitary, sewers, um, and then the, the areaways. And then there was many other unknowns that we would soon come to find out as we were in construction on this project. So. Um, again, here's just a quick snapshot of some of the utilities, things that we had to deal with. These crazy messes of conduits and everything. Um, you see back-to-back -back manholes. One could be electrical, one could be storm sewer, one could be, you know, you name it. We, we had it on the site. So, and then this image up here um, where we ran into uh, NRG steam line and how do you deal with a steam line in a where your place where you're trying to grow trees. Um, so it, it was a challenge that we had to work through on the spot, you know, schedules of the essence and, and everything. So um, working through how to insulate that. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit more too on, on the design layout, but the flexibility that we gave ourselves with the design to be able to move trees around and not have to lose any because of a, an unknown condition that we came across on site. So uh, one thing with that was the, uh, what we call the grove areas. Um, and these are the spaces, these are the, the framework that they use to pour the concrete, uh, where the tree locations would be. Um, you know, if we came across a utility, we had some flexibility within that overall context to be able to move those trees around uh, to fit around the utilities. Um, so, as you look down the mall, you had the first couple blocks uh, on the very southern end, the two very northern blocks on the northern end, where you had the closest proximity to Loring Woods Park and to the Mississippi River. Um, we looked at those areas along with the overlay of the, util the existing utilities that we knew um, and the areaways and all of that. And we looked at, okay, where can we actually plant? Where would be the best place to have a huge uh, amount of planting uh, within that context? So this diagram just shows, shows you that those two southern blocks, northern blocks really open themselves up to that um, overall. But again, as you worked your way in, you had a lot more utilities to deal with, but there were still ways that we could work through it with the Grove situation. So the framework of how we, how we looked at this, again, the woods, the groves are in the blue, and then in the Nicolette Center, which was a more, um, uh, and I'll get into it more, but the, the artwork and uh, the very straight, narrow pathways and, and, and tree layout. 
So along with that, we also wanted to uh, look at how we could have some very distinctive uh, paving patterns that would go along with um, how you would experience the space, um, not only with the, the, the way the trees change from a very open pit in the woods areas to um, the open groves with pavement and, and you're walking through a tree canopy essentially to the center and so on the ends, the, the woods areas, we, um, we had the leaf pattern that was um, stenciled into the concrete. And as you worked your way in, we had branch patterns. And then in the center, the very more formal uh, location, we had the basket weed pattern. So this is what um, our standard, uh, I guess, grove block looked like, um, where you have your, your main corridor along the, the building facades. And then you have your grove areas with the very distinctive uh, exposed aggregate pattern and then your tree layout within that. So here's a look at uh, how we came through with the, the stenciling of this. Um, they ha we had, again, the three different pattern types, but then we had a variety of um, density of branches and leaf patterns amongst those as well. So, uh, we had to go through that with the contractor, and it was a very uh, open discussion with them on what we wanted to see, and I was constantly on site with these guys working through it, and they actually did a fantastic job with, with it once they got the flow of what we were looking for. Um, so there's different patterns. Um, so again, with, with urban forestry and how we were working this in, um, what, we looked, what we looked at was um, <coughs> with the existing trees that were there that were, um, were running out of soil volume to, to produce any more further growth and, and really um, provide that canopy that we all hope and wish to see on, on all our trees, um, providing them with the amount of soil that they need uh, to grow to their mature level. So we actually looked at and provided all, between 12 and 1300 cubic feet of soil per tree, which exceeded um, most uh, urban forestry uh, recommendations even. So, uh, so we, we were able to do that, the, a lot of structural soils. Um, so not only within the uh, woods areas, soil expanded out past those underneath the uh, pavement surfaces and the grove areas where you have a, a, a pervious surface, we were able to extend uh, structural planting soil, sand-based soil throughout that entire area. Isolated irrigation for at the tree pit itself, but uh, also under the pavement uh, that could be turned on at later date when, when the rooting uh, would reach and expand to the, that area. And here's just a further look at, uh, again, the groves and what we're looking at for the woods, groves, and, and rows uh, throughout, throughout Nicolette and how that would look in section. Uh, again, you have your uh, sidewalk where oftentimes the sidewalks landed where an area away for, for which was the um, basement of these of adjacent buildings uh, where we weren't able to do any planting, um, things like that. So we really had to work within these very confined spaces to try and get as many trees in as we, as we could on this site. and then varying different um, opening sizes for different size trees that were going in um, also was a, a, played a big part in this and how we could um, not only uh, provide as many trees as we could to provide an overall dense canopy, um, but to also leave some of the space open for seeding and, and um, mar future uh, farmers markets and things like that that were going on on site. So this is what it looks like today. Um, and then tree species, um, diversity again as, as Philip mentioned is a super important part of this, um, ensuring that you have a diverse level of uh, canopy so that if a, an unknown condition or a, a known condition comes through, uh, we don't wipe out the entire a streetscape through that. So we looked at a, a variety of different species throughout this whole area. Um, 
I, w I will have to say on the Nicolette Center Mall, we do have all um, swamp white oaks. So going against his, his recommendation on that. Um, but we, again, wanted this very formal look uh, that was all one tree species that, um, you know, so. And then the woods understories, uh, native species uh, plant selection that, um, that represented the Mississippi woods and the Loring woods of the adjacent areas and the whole regional area of, of Minneapolis. And then just to give you a, a little uh, better idea of some of the other design elements on the project. So lighting um, was also another key portion of this project. Tree up lighting, uh, overhead uh, lighting along the mall, um, and then just trying to uh, provide the best navigation for people to, along the mall as well. So how this is, how do we provide signage for the entire mall so people can navigate their way along? Uh, we worked with Pentagram uh, out of New York City on this project, as you guys are probably all familiar with uh, a lot of their work. Um, so. There we go. So as I mentioned also uh, as well, we had these key moments along the mall where uh, people could interact. Uh, the light walk in blocks five and six, and uh, the, also the light ribbon uh, along the entire length of the mall at the top of the, the light poles. Here's one of the cafes, and the, one of the crazy things about this image, I don't know if you noticed it, but the construction fences along the entire interior side of that. So as, as this was being um, constructed, we had to work through things like this. Uh, you know, how, does, uh, how do we get this place back up and running as quickly as possible so that they can, uh, you know, during the busiest times of the year, still be making money, having people out on their cafes, while construction is happening just right on the other side of the street. So it was a, a very complex um, ordeal with trying to keep businesses open the entire length of construction. Oops. So here we go. So Nicolette Center, um, what would make you know, the center a great place, a great destination for people to show up and come to? Um, so how could we uh, how could we bring people to this space all year round? Um, keep it flexible, farmers market, things like that. Um, we looked at um, all along the mall. There was all kinds of art that was brought and also existed on the mall previously. So um, bringing that back into this whole realm, uh, the lighting. Uh, we had the armature structure that, that extends down the two length blocks, um, seating underneath, everything. There we go. And that is the library there. So, uh, so this is where the reading room now is, out in front of the library, so it's a very programmable space. People can use that year-round. Um, and here's a sort of before image and an after rendering. Um, as you can see, there, um, there's not a lot of photos of this currently be, as it's been constructed. Um, we're still waiting to get a lot of our um, photography done on this project. but. Um, it's been a very exciting project. Um, we, had, we had some issues with, with planting, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well. But, um, you know, with uh, the connection to urban forestry and, um, you know, uh, overall design, you know, we, we, again, we had those, the, those moments of conflict where we um, didn't always have the same opinion as, as the urban forester, but 
we were able to work through a lot of that. And um, yeah, so I guess we can open up this to questions and if you want to come back up and we can go through any of that. So thank you. <laughs> No, not there. Oh, maybe she. Oh, good. There. Oh, oh, there it is. There's the piece. Yeah. Uh, a comment and a challenge for Philip. Uh, I, I appreciated seeing the soil up there writ large because you don't have tree tops unless you have decent root establishment. But I'd like to challenge you to add two things to the soil quality aspect, and that's the biology, the microorganisms, bacteria, mycorrhiza, and so forth. So that has a big impact on uh, nutrients being available for the trees. The other one is, and it's oftentimes out of the urban foresters, even the, out of the landscape architects control, and that's the civil engineers that like to run 95 proctor density mm -hmm. from right-of-way line to right-of-way line, and then you're coming in trying to put plants on top of that, and there's no connection between that nice volume of soil that you put on the top and percolation into the subsoil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, is this thing, there we are. Uh, yeah, the specification spe does have a, a, I guess to get some of that, uh, biology in the soil, the, sp the specification we have uh, requires uh, an amount of organic matter to, to encourage the, that to, to happen, but that's a great, a great point. And, and keeping, uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, thinking of ways, I mean, we, we require a, s a minimum amount of volume to get the, where the majority of roots would, would be, but keeping, connecting the two different, you know, connecting A and B is an important uh, soil consideration as well. So I, I appreciate that. And, and I guess the, the, the standards that I outlined w are the minimums, uh, you know, to think about, you know, 500 cubic feet or 125. What you're um, into with the 95 proper density is that's engineers and roadway contractors, that's just, that's their mindset. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way for them to build their roads. Uh, all they have to do is come back and rip it afterwards, but they, they've never been asked or told to do that before. And all they're worried about is the hard surface, the concrete, the walks, the curbs. They don't care anything about the plants and that they, they need something different in terms of that connected profile. Yeah, I would. Th it's. I think it's also like thinking about which which typology are we thinking about? So we, we can achieve very um, compacted situations where we need to uh, if we're looking at a, um, a, a system that's a structural soil. Like, like you know, you, you can compact the sand-based structural soil, you can com compact yeah. a rock-based structural soil and still have space, right. spaces for tree roots to go. You know, I'm not, I won't pretend to, uh, to represent the other plants that are trying to grow into that situation. Um, but we all, you know, our specifications describe where the trees will be planted needs to be different than um, the rock-based structural soil because you can't dig into it. So that needs, that needs to be a, a, a planting soil that's, that, that isn't compacted like the surrounding area where the tree goes needs to be different, um, but it needs to, uh, there needs to be interplay there. Yeah, do you have th thoughts well, on that too? Yeah, so the, uh, again, with the sand-based soil that we used on this project, I mean, you can still compact that to a very high level, but it still is super porous. And so the, the root, fine roots are gonna find their way through, uh, through that soil volume and, and find uh, the nutrients that they need. Um, so the same base soil, um, we also had the biological package that is included as part of that uh, specification. Um, but to me, uh, in my understanding of same base soil, the, the pore space was right around 40%, even though it's still compacted to 95%. Um, when you place a sand, a sand in, a, in a tree pit, it automatically is pretty much at 80%, and then they come in. Uh, and compact that further in lifts, uh, like six inch layer lifts, but you still have that porous volume there that is holding. Well, I know Minneapolis has a sandy loam soil because yeah. it's in that area of the floodplain. Right. Uh, we've got clay around here. When you come through and do 95 proctor density, there's no pore space. 
right? So you get, you get absolutely no through flow of, of percolation. It's all going to be taken laterally. Yep. And that's a challenge that we run into in, in all urban projects, right? There's a lot of crazy soils that we're working with in, in a city urban environment. Um, and, and you have to weigh that in on, on the overall project and, and better, best practices for the tree. You know, what, what uh, type of soil is the best for the trees to grow in and, and the other plant material as well. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there always is more <laughs> room for more collaboration, right? Um, you know, through, throughout this entire process, the design process, at key, key moments throughout the design, we were reaching out to local expertise, uh, our local lands landscape architect, the urban forestry uh, department, uh, local nurseries on, on the best species to use for the project, uh, but also looking at um, some of the things that Philip talked about and uh, once you cross that threshold of a number of species in a certain area, you want to start looking at uh, using alternative species. Um, and that was the case, I believe, with the honey locust, which was heavily used in the downtown environment. A great tree, a great urban tree to use, um, but we, uh, and we would have uh, liked to use it potentially, but it was you know, already overused. And so we, we did look at a, a number of different trees that we could use that um, still got us the sort of the same design intent that we were looking for. Uh, is your question about th specifically this project or, or m applied uh, a cr uh, further? Yeah, I guess, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's probably part of the, the plan review process where, where we might have a, and this is an interesting project, I guess, you know, I'm talking about some of our current uh, systems or current, you know, the, the, the plan review process and, and these guidelines and the typologies and that there's city, city standard specification. Well, this project's been getting worked on for a really long time, mm -hmm. <laughs> long enough that it, it, it predates some of the strides we've taken in, in, in our recent work. And so, so we weren't having as many, you know, our department and, and, the, pro and the design w were not interacting th that much. Um, in, in some of these aspects. So I think some of that probably, you know, I think some of the, some of the dialogue would have been a, 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 like, hey, oh, um, we noticed there's two blocks of one, um, one genus being used, in fact, mm -hmm. one species. Uh, we in, would encourage tr trying to, uh, you know, modify that for, so that we don't lose that, that right. design uh, to one pest that might come through. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be, a, it, that would be a dialogue. Like, well, yeah. it should be this for that. Well, what, I don't know, could we think about these other species? Well, maybe, I don't know, and, you know, and see where it lands. You know, thinking, there, th but it's a, it's a challenge. We, we're, we're careful, and the, and the person who, who sits on the, on the design review team is very careful to, um, to, to speak uh, the language of a, f to, to, to represent the, he always refers to wheelhouse, but mm -hmm. you know, like, I, I'm not gonna pretend to be a designer. I'm not, I'm an urban forester, so I'm not, you know, I, I don't wanna get into the, the different d 
design aspects, but, but it is a, a landscape and a resource that we're going to be taking over, and, and, and so it is, it's, uh, it's a collaboration, but, yeah. but roles are, we have different roles in it that we need, should be cognizant of. Yeah, to, to touch base on that a little bit more, I mean, now um, your department does have a more formal review process, whereas when this was going through design, it was not fully there. It was not fully established to the guidelines and, and things that they're, they're going through now. Not to say that we didn't reach out to the expertise, because we did. We absolutely uh, talked with people all along the entire process, but it was at, it was at bigger key moments. Um, but we were also gathering information from so many directions that we, uh, you know, you can't, you can't rely on everything that you're hearing from the urban forester because there's other elements that you have to play in effect, you know, play into the, the overall picture. Um, and, that, and that looks back on, on, on some of the trees and, and we actually didn't preserve any of the trees on site. Um, and that was looking at, at the whole project holistically. Um, the trees that we felt from our end were in good shape on the, the most northern two blocks were uh, like six and eight inch caliper trees in good shape. Um, but what we were also trying to do was bring back that curvature road uh, onto those northern blocks. And by doing that, there was a conflict there as well, um, which didn't allow us to save any of those. Some of the larger trees more in the heart of, of this project, um, you know, Philip may have a different opinion on it, that the tree's living, it's, it's healthy, but maybe one side of the tree was lopped off and, and not structurally looking that great or not um, aesthetically looking that great from our end. Um, so there's, those are some of the things that we battle with too when it, when it comes to this topic. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've got a, a series of some images from Google Street View that I, I'd like to share. Some from the project and some from other areas that really dig into this sort of um, uh, preservation idea. Um, but, you, but you had a question first and then maybe I can do that. Oh. <laughs> And so I can talk about that from the, the uh, sort of historical standpoint. Again, um, the, the, the way that Lawrence Halpern wanted to look at this space is a very social space, you know, bringing people in for the farmer's market type thing and, and pe people interacting in that space. So creating the reason why he went to more of this uh, curvature roadway was to create these pockets of, of areas, uh, the groves essentially. Um, the, the seating areas for the restaurants where people would gather and hang out and spend time in this environment. Um, and so we were really trying to reinforce that with, with the new design. And again, uh, not all of the blocks, the roadway was carried through with the curvature. So bringing that all the way through the entire design was a big, big component of this. Uh, I'll take the, in thinking of the last one first, snow removal. Yeah, the, it's, it's, removed from all sorts of not just this uh, stretch of downtown but throughout all, much of downtown if you if you're in downtown minneapolis at night you're going to hear a lot of beep 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 <laughs> and huge trucks piling it and taking it other places to sit and wait the season out until it melts away um, and the, your other question about oh the 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 six hundred dollars per tree so the goal is to not use that or, or really the goal is to encourage planting trees that will establish within a reasonable amount of time. Um, and, if, if, and, and if that is not a reasonable solution in the design, 
then we want to ensure that we're able to replace those trees. Now, if the tree, if, you know, there's um, really great nursery practices that was preparing the trees for this pro mm -hmm. project, uh, root pruning uh, to, to make sure there was roots within the, the near space. And, and they, were, they, were in the they were out in the nursery in the fields getting ready to come here with, with really great nursery practices. So if, if those trees all establish well if the irrigation does what it needs to do um, and the, everything establishes well and say there say there were uh, I, I don't know what, what's the average uh, cal like if they were five inch uh, caliper trees or, or six inch caliper trees for six years that six hundred dollars just stays available on the books um, in, in, but if it but if, if but if it's not needed for all 200 and some of these trees then th the money's not used, um, and it would go. It would go. It would go back to. Uh, it could be either, and and so some so so you know do it. You know talk to the the financial. Sure. It's a it's a it's a uh, ir, 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 what's the word of the. It, it's 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 committed, um, but not used. So it can it can be sitting in the. It's a, it's essentially a, a check written that would only be cashed under XYZ circumstance, but the money doesn't transfer in that case. If someone wants to just put up the money and then get it refunded, that's a possibility too. But uh, however your financial people want to do it, if, if it's, it, it's essentially a, a check that just that doesn't get cashed unless it needs to be. And, and I'll also, kind of going back to that sort of historical thing with the, uh, with the trees that were existing on site, um, you know, we wanted to look at this holistically and get it back to a point where we could provide these greater soil volumes for these trees um, so that they could live on beyond sort of that typical life expectancy of the 25-year project, right? So there's, there's two different life expectancies that we're talking about. You're talking about the life expectancy of a tree, you know, that 80-year range, 75, 80-year range to uh, most typical design projects, are, they're right around 25 years, it seems like, anymore. Um, so trying to establish something uh, so that down the road, when this does get turned over and the, you know, they want to redesign this again, that the soil volume's there, that you can't use that as an excuse down the road to, um, you know, to a future design on why these trees couldn't remain where they were. All of the... Um, all of the storm water or storm sewer systems and utility work that we had to redo are all now worked around the existing tree system. And there's a lot of trees on the site. We almost doubled the amount of trees that were previously, previously on the mall. So trying to establish some of those new um, principles for the project, I guess. And that's and that's that's the, the, that that challenge of the you know this was uh, the the original design th that was done in the 60s was it, it, was, it was man that photo you had of the tree of the success succeeding trees on that mm -hmm. at that point when the picture was taken maybe they started to decline at some point because yeah. of low soil volume or whatever yeah, that was redone in the eight, late 80s early 90s and then it was redone again uh, you know in the in the in the alt tens um, and and so when when will it be redone again will trees be preserved should uh, uh, what I wonder as as an urban forester is do I think about a project like this and, and a space like this and go, oh, you know, that's fine. They, there's, there's, this is the design. That's great. Um, I, I, should, should I not have expectations of, of preserving these trees is, is something I, I wonder about. Should I just expect, well, at some point, uh, the design principles will change. It will become vogue to put uh, very straight trees in instead of this curvilinear thing. Or, or like, what what will be 25 years from now um, that that will reshape this? Oh, it just won't work because we're doing this. Or, or will it be preserved? Or, or will what will come? You know, predicting the future. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, that's something I'm like. I don't know. Do I do I get on my like? You know, do I wrap my arms around this tree and say, no, don't take it. They worked really hard. They had a really great design. It's really cool, don't you? But yeah, but that was, pff, who cares about, you know, 20, 2015. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, good. that's old. <laughs> I want to show some of those images. I think that'd be, that'd be interesting to see. Okay, what was programmable space? That's a term I'm not familiar with. Yeah, so uh, essentially a, a 
people trying to utilize that space for specific things, whether it was the library having people come out into the space and do like a, um, it was like a theater essentially, so they could have a stage um, out there and use it as a performance area or um, like a, a sports field is a pro programmable space. You can do this multiple different program activity. events on it, activities. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't even do it. Wow. <laughs> Weird. Isn't technology cool? How do I, how do I switch do apps? Time? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we probably just have to, I don't know if we have to close yours all yeah, the way. Probably. If that's okay. Yep. Oh, I didn't close the right one, did I? I might have done it, though, if it stopped the presentation. There you go. Oh, thank you. We're collaborating. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought it'd be fun to, for context, to see some of these different um, spaces in over time. But th now, this one isn't on the plan, but I think this is a great example of, of you were referring to the middle of the plan of, of trees that just weren't doing it, you know, and, and, and so this is, I think, an example. This is not on Nicollet, but this is Hennepin nearby in downtown, and, you know, here's a couple uh, honey locusts that, um, this is when they got planted in 2000, not when they got planted, but this is 2009. I don't know how long they had been there, um, but over time, oh, wrong way, uh, here they are in 2017, so 12 years of going from this to this. They're holding, you know, they're, they're, they're still green, uh, and, and there's room to put other th stuff on there, there, and people can sit there, but they don't have the soil vial where they're really like taking off. So if this is, they're getting removed in a, a future project, and, and we're getting bigger soil volumes and more appropriate um, planting to go in here to have longer term benefits from this location. Yeah. That, that speaks to your 75% of, of size. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so what's seventy-five percent reduced by seventy-five percent? So like twenty, what twenty-five? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, and that's the local local considerations um, is, is is super important. Sure, yeah. sure. We've all got we've all got our work cut out for us. Yeah. Uh, so here's a couple other locations across town. Um, here's a, a recent project that was redone in Minneapolis. If you happen to be visit, visiting, check it out. Uh, this is the uh, view of the sculpture garden from the street that goes along it. I think it was, um, this, is bef uh, this is before the project started. This is in the midst of the project. They needed a complete clean slate uh, to, to do the project, nearly. I mean, there's some um, remaining trees around the perimeter. I think not counting, and, but there were a lot of trees in this middle area as well. Uh, there's one like cottonwood floating around somewhere out here that, that was preserved. Um, but it was, this is then the, the installation. Um, and there's, there's new, new trees went into a lot of these. You can hardly see them from this view. Um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, okay, does that, oh, there's that cottonwood that, that was preserved. It was part of a, an art installation. I think it was the reason why. But it's, a, you know, okay, I think it was something like 400 trees removed, uh, and this is one of those sites, not counting the perimeter of spruce. And another view of that from another angle, uh, similar thing, you know, the perimeter is, is getting opened up. This is before and then after, uh, you know, some trees were, were saved, a, a row of uh, hawthorns uh, right here, and there's that, that, that cottonwood. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's a different design. It, it, they wanted to be able to view into it, and they wanted to redo stuff uh, across the entire space. To, to re and, and so I wonder, like, oh, fine, it's, it's, a, it's the sculpture garden. It, it's going to be redesigned all the time. I don't expect long-term benefits out of these trees. Or should we think differently? I don't know. I think that's, a, that's something to be thinking about. This is, this is a long Nicollet, mm -hmm. um, but this is not, uh, these are, these, this is Nicollet here, um, but this is, th what I'm looking at here is, is the, the trees on the private side of the line. Mm -hmm. Here's some public trees. Um, we'll see, you know, I don't know what uh, the, the, the future holds for, for this ended up being that they, they, they changed it uh, and, and we got uh, this uh, angled turf, which, it, which it, it's probably nice to sit there, um, but, but we lost a lot of canopy 
um, benefit and you know green space. I think this is the, these, this row of just matureness um, was was designed away for for the, for the sake of the, the future design. And it, you know you can see the building better. That, so so you know what do we what are the cost benefits? Um, uh, thinking yeah, that of that project was going on at the exact same time that ours was under construction as well. So there was <laughs> yeah yet another challenge yeah. that, that <laughs> you, you got to navigate. Here's right. here's where the what was it called the. Um, the, the theater in the round. Yeah, theater right in the round. The library. Yeah. Uh, this was a oh man, this this one, this one, this this one, this part of it hurt. I remember walking this with yeah. some folks from our tree commission. And I was like, oh really? Nothing. We can't preserve any of this existing. Uh, you know, I guess th this scrape, this this streetscape. This one was was a challenge. So to, yeah, these these were the two okay. northern blocks that I was referring to, where the the road alignment is obviously straight. Um, some beautiful trees that we we did think were in really good t condition, and yeah. we would have loved to try to. And we probably should have worked hard on collaborating on that, you know. Yeah. But uh, there was an overall design intent that we were also looking for too. So yeah. yeah. So so you know if we were if we were having this conversation, you're, you know, towards that time, you know, I think uh, you know we we we'd be hashing it out a little bit more, you know, and right. and like th this is this is those trees, and they were in individual tree, you know, quote tree pits. Um, yes, uh, but over time, uh, uh, well, they're right here. We put in, you can see the tree protection fence, uh, drastically too small compared to our current standard, but they went into a, a, a unified growing space where they, they're shared, a shared volume of soil for them to be in, and that was the same practice going all the way down this space. Uh, and they were, they were coming in, into their own um, mm -hmm. in, in being established, which is, and it's rare to have trees uh, this big and succeeding and having the internodal growth on their, their to, to be the, this well in the, a downtown setting and so it was, it was uh, you know you know it's you know you, I like starting to see the construction equipment parking in the shade of those trees uh, and and knowing that something different's coming and and I don't have the the planting um, picture on, on this one but the, here's where the the new trees will will be put in so it's you know my, my I, I'm going I, I sort of my challenge is like, well, well, could we have just worked harder? Could we have changed the curve? Of a linear curve? Could we have saved one side versus the other, or or even just a couple trees? You know, I don't know. Um, it's it's this is a this is a uh, the balance is out. You know, mm -hmm. to try to figure out what what it should, what we can do and what we can't. And so some of these are also just further down that same stretch. Um, so I'll just walk through them kind of quickly. Um, at some point, we we combine the rooting spaces. We, as in people before me, um, construction equipment started parking in the shade, storing a lot of stuff in the shade, and then and then they and then they went away. Um, but 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 you know this is this is, this wasn't there. There wasn't this. The, there wasn't the curve. The, the road is curving, and the, this this scape is curving. This feels you know in my you know I don't know what's underground. Uh, I didn't get into the weeds in, in this project in mm -hmm. that that way. But to know like what needed to be considered. Um, but from from this you know it's like well it seems like it's almost in the same spot. You know could could we have done something? Um, you know uh, but but I think it's a it's. I, th I think that's that 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 question of um, time scale and and design. That this is that I think this is the ongoing thing to be to be thinking about. And where where will we go uh, as we in our fields move together in, in right. tending this type of a space? Other other Maybe. questions or dialogue? Yeah. Philip, yeah, especially for you. Uh, what, how do you think? How do you balance ecology, natural ecology? With urban trees, you know, in the urban center, trees that want to grow are like tree of heaven, honey locust, calorie pear, they all have their problems. But as you move out, you get a little more palate. Just what is your opinion on some of that? Uh, well, I guess I look at the different types of spaces we manage trees as I think about that. You know, we manage we manage street trees, and there's not a lot we can we can we can choose from a, a palette that might uh, we can choose from a palette that is 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 native and and uh, less native um, in in that area. But we're but where there's so much challenges to that space um, that I want that I think about. Um, we need to find the trees that are tough to be able to handle these really weird conditions that we're introducing them into. So our forest loving trees might not, uh, you know, deep, rich, moist soil, we might not be able to ever do that in, in the streetscape. Um, but then we have our parklands, 
and where there's mowed turf. Now that also isn't, a f we could do that a little more in those locations, but the places where we really can, fortunately, we also manage trees and woodlands. And, and, the, and that's where, and I think that's the spectrum. And so in our woodlands, we're, we're, we're being very specific to say, what is the, what is the ecotype um, you know, provided by our Department of Natural Resources? What, what are we working in here when we need to remove a tree for one of these, maybe one of these pests has, have dealt with it, um, and, it's, and it needs to be removed for a hazard or something. If there's available space to plant a tree, we really want to make sure we're aligning the the ecosystem of of what what is in that area. We're, we have a, a Mississippi's in a river gorge. Um, what's the there's a different appropriate tree for the base of that river gorge, um, up to the top of it where it's where it's it goes from a, a floodplain to a savanna and 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 it's it's a, 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 a maple basswood forest in between. So it's very specific uh, to there. But 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 I, but I I can't pretend that the streetscape is a savanna. Um, you know, it's the, sir, there are similar similarities, but mm -hmm. but I can't. I, if we're only relying on bur oak out there um, in the, in our streetscape, we're we're stuck when when we get a pest that might tree impact that. Tree here is ornamental pear. You oh, repair. You can plant it anywhere; it grows well. But it's becoming a scapist pest. It's going to be banned from uh, a lot of street tree plantings. But it's one of those trees that has an ecological connotation over here. But it's very usable in an urban sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think thinking about where we put trees like that, like uh, calorie pear is not doesn't make it in in up in Minneapolis, but but there are trees that are that someone might say, hey, we don't want we don't want ginkgos here. That's not th th it doesn't provide as many benefits to our pollinators as a white oak, um, but it but it survives, and there's not a lot of pests that get it, and it mm -hmm. still provides e services. It might not provide the same services as this, but it but it but it but it works and it makes it and so it's it's a the diversity I think gets us there. Mm -hmm. yeah, a few there more minutes go. if we want. This is fun. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that you use the uh, enormous variety of cruise dolly as one of your uh, island plantings. When you go that specific on a cultivar, you're you're bringing in something that's suited to one particular area that has a very narrow range of adaption mm -hmm. uh, to insects, diseases, and so forth. And it, it just seems to me you need to diversify, kind of following up on, on Justin's comment, you need to diversify the, uh, the seed sources of uh, what's available. The problem is that mm -hmm. it's a more cultural question, mm -hmm. is that these nurseries pump out uh, these uniform trees, a lot of them are grafted. We have no idea where the rootstock came from, whether the rootstock is adapted. And so we have these kind of lofty ideas where we want to go, but we may not have the building blocks to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. <laughs> I don't know if there's much I need to add to that, but. Um yeah, I mean, we're often we're often uh, tied to what the nurseries are doing too. Uh, so there's a there's a collaboration there that has to happen uh, as much as we can um, to ensure that what we're hoping to see in the design can come to fruition based upon what they're what they're producing. Eric, what's in the head of a landscape architect to see a whole bunch of trees the same? This formality it seems like it's no I I mean a strong central leader is often a really important part of a, a tree and the structure of it um, the the branching structure you know the more upright the branch goes the the weaker it becomes um, so and when you're looking at when you're looking at that, you want to look at your your microclimates. You know, are, are you in a high wind area? Um, so there's there's a lot of things that go into it, but um, you know, aesthetically, we're just looking for for something that's a uniform tree amongst amongst all of them. Um, Well, I say that when you're looking at a very, I guess, a very formal street tree, looking like we had with the the. Uh, Swamp white oaks. We were trying to get them, those as uniform as possible when we were tree tagging. 
um, with the, the birches and some of the other trees in the groves and the woodland areas, we were okay with it being a little more um, yeah, informal, for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to keep learning throughout the day. I'll, I'll hand it back over to our, to our leader to, to guide us through our adventure today. <laughs>